The miracle doctor won't be a kept man. My heart belongs ashore. Chapter 621 Faber's gaze followed Rory Yates's pointing finger, locking eyes with Kieran. At that moment, Luther's head buzzed. He instinctively looked at Rory, trying to understand how he had managed to offend Kieran. Rory, oblivious to the change in Luther's expression, portrayed himself as a victim. Uncle Luther, I came here today to propose to Shuri, but this couple not only ruined my plans, they deliberately poisoned me and tried to cheat me out of money, he claimed, appearing very wronged. Hearing Rory's words stirred a storm of emotions in Luther. Describing Kieran and Yvonne as dishonorable was akin to signing one's death warrant. Furthermore, Luther analyzed Rory's story, and it became clear to him that Rory was framing Kieran. Though Luther had limited interactions with Kieran, he knew Kieran to be an upright and honorable person. Rory did not know that Luther was acquainted with Kieran and was even less aware that the Lions Club had been subdued by Kieran. Believing it would be easy for the Lions Club to deal with Kieran, he urged Luther into action. Uncle Luther, quickly deal with this bastard. He's too arrogant, and make that woman give me the antidote. He looked at Yvonne Quinn sharply. If you don't kneel in front of me today and apologize, I will make you wish you were dead. He then looked at Kieran. If you know what's good for you, apologize quickly. Otherwise, my Uncle Luther will slap your head into pieces. When Faber heard that he had to slap Kieran's head into pieces, he felt his head buzz. He subconsciously shook his head to confirm that he had not become a broken watermelon. Hit Kieran? No matter how brave they were, they wouldn't dare. They were not on the same level of strength. Yvonne, seizing the moment, mockingly exclaimed, Honey, someone wants me to kneel and apologize. Kieran looked directly at Luther. He dares? Rory, unable to contain his frustration, spat on the ground in anger. Before he could continue his tirade, his knees buckled, and he found himself involuntarily kneeling. Confused and angry, Rory turned around to find Luther, his complexion fluctuating between pale and dark, had been the one to kick him down. Uncle Luther, you. Rory began but was sharply cut off. Shut up, Luther commanded. He looked at Kieran and pleaded, Young Master York, can you give me some face? His tone was reverent, much like one would use when speaking to a superior. This exchange left Rory dumbfounded and the surrounding crowd in utter silence. Rory struggled to comprehend why Luther, a top fighter in the Lions Club, would seek mercy from Kieran. Luther's internal turmoil was evident. Without having experienced Kieran's formidable presence firsthand, one could not truly understand his power. Kieran was someone Luther knew he could not afford to offend, a realization that led him to a position of submission. Young Master York, Luther exclaimed and fell on his knees before Kieran. His actions left the onlookers even more baffled. They were completely lost, unable to grasp why one of the Lions Club's top elders would lower himself in such a manner before Kieran. Just who was Kieran? He lost a bet of 200 billion to me, Kieran stated calmly. Our Lions Club will pay, Faber quickly responded. Are you out of your mind, Faber? Rory, finally grasping the situation, was filled with fury. Luther's face turned extremely grim, but he didn't answer, still looking at Kieran and waiting for his forgiveness. Kieran raised an eyebrow, looking at Rory, considering Faber knelt today, I'll let you leave in one piece. From now on, every time I see you, I'll hit you once. You. What right do you have? I. Rory began but was cut off as Luther slapped him twice, sending Rory's retort back down his throat. Rory screamed, blood trickling from the corner of his mouth, his eyes burning with rage as he looked at Luther. If you harass Shuri again within the next five days, don't blame me if you find yourself on an early trip to the afterlife. Kieran warned nonchalantly. To the afterlife? Two. Rory's words were cut off again as Luther punched him in the mouth, knocking out his teeth. Rory fell backward, hitting the ground hard. He spat blood, his eyes nearly bulging out of their sockets, unable to comprehend why Luther would hit him. He was the son of the club's president, deserving of their respect. Rage and humiliation twisted his face, a fury he couldn't contain. Young Master Kieran, rest assured. Luther quickly responded on behalf of Rory. Let's go, Kieran said, his impression of Luther still somewhat favorable, sparing him from further disgrace. Thank you for sparing my life, young Master York. We will deliver the money on time tomorrow, Luther said, then stood up, picked up Rory, and with a burst of energy, leaped into the air, making a swift exit. He felt as though he had been granted a pardon. Looking at the furious Rory in his arms, Luther realized this was like saving a life. Meanwhile, the spectators, already in a state of shocked fear, looked at Kieran as if he were a monster. Daring to demand money from the Lions Club, making its left elder kneel, and even having the elder hit the club president's son, who exactly was Kieran? Kieran was nothing short of a miracle. Kieran ignored the crowd's reactions and began to administer acupuncture to Shuri swiftly. 
With each insertion and removal of the needles, he channeled his internal energy into her, enveloping and gradually dissolving the ruptured brain tumor until it vanished. After about half an hour, Kieran removed the needles and gently tapped Shuri's head. Shuri gasped and opened her eyes, surprised to find herself still on the CT scanner bed, surrounded by people. Her first reaction was relief at being alive, and she quickly turned to Kieran. I'm... I'm still alive. Wanted to die, Kieran teased with a smile. Shuri's face flushed red with embarrassment, and she shook her head then paused, her expression turning to astonishment. My head. It's healed? What else? Kieran asked with a smile. How? How did it heal? Was there surgery? Shuri asked, ecstatic. Dr. York treated you with acupuncture. Dr. Huang chimed in from the side, his face beaming. Acupuncture? Shuri questioned, puzzled. Kieran touched his nose, finding Dr. Huang's answer somewhat ambiguous. Kieran healed you with acupuncture, Yvonne clarified from the side. Is that even possible? Shuri was in disbelief. Get a scan to check, Kieran instructed, looking at Dr. Huang for Shuri's peace of mind. Right away, Dr. Huang complied, immediately conducting the scan. The results came back clear of any tumor, leaving Dr. Huang utterly amazed at Kieran's abilities. Kieran looked at Shuri. Now you don't need to live in the shadow of it anymore. Shuri, seeing the before and after scans, was overwhelmed with joy. Let's go in for the banquet, Kieran said, walking into the hotel. Shuri got off the bed and saw the roses at the door meant for the proposal. She looked at the security guard. Clean it up. Kieran, without looking back, jokingly said, Why waste? Someone set it up for free. How nice. Shuri was stunned. Wasteful? The crowd silently pondered. A person worth 200 billion concerned about a few flowers? Chapter. Kieran, of course, wasn't concerned about the flowers themselves. His action was a statement to all of Fox, showcasing Mystic or Enterprise's audacity to stand against the Lions Club, ensuring that, henceforth, everyone would hold Mysticor in awe. Additionally, as the host of tonight's banquet, he naturally didn't want the guests to feel too tense. A simple joke helped everyone relax a bit. As Kieran entered the hall, Manager Zhang was already waiting at the door. Having witnessed Kieran's earlier display, Manager Zhang was in awe, regarding him almost as a deity. He quickly approached, bowing deeply to welcome Kieran. Young Master Kieran, please. Kieran nodded slightly and proceeded forward. Suddenly, a glamorous woman caught his eye. She was dressed in a form-fitting orange-red short skirt suit that highlighted her delicate and voluptuous figure, drawing attention to her perfect curves. Her fair hands were crossed in front of her, covering her abdomen, with her slender, beautiful legs encased in flesh-colored stockings extending down from the hem of her skirt. Despite the seasonal mismatch, she wore black leather boots that added to her allure, making her appear even more enchanting and seductive. Her long black hair cascaded down her back with neat bangs covering her smooth white forehead. Her sparkling eyes fixed on Kieran conveyed innocence and beauty, reminiscent of the girl next door, appearing incredibly docile. Her already fair skin seemed almost translucent, cheeks flushed with a rosy glow, akin to a noble lady encountering her beloved brimming with charm. The woman before him was Ruth Sutton. Ruth looked at Kieran, her face filled with joy, her heart fluttering as if struck by a young deer. The only downside was seeing Yvonne clinging to Kieran's arm like a little wife, stirring a mix of sadness and inferiority in her, as if she had lost something precious to herself. Ruth is here? Kieran initiated the conversation. Kieran had a good impression of Ruth. This woman had a kind of determination and perseverance. She believed in him without hesitation and did not change her trust in him at all. Ruth hadn't expected Kieran to greet her personally and was overjoyed, nodding eagerly. Young Master Kieran, I came to attend the banquet organized by Mysticor Enterprise here, Kieran explained simply. I know, I know, Ruth nodded excitedly, then became somewhat awkward, unsure of what to say next, especially in front of Yvonne. Yvonne felt a slight resentment, noting how women seemed naturally drawn to Kieran wherever he went. Unfortunately, these women couldn't compare to snow in Kieran's eyes. His love for her was unparalleled. If not for the love spell, she might not have had the chance to stay by his side. Ruth, observant as ever, noticed Yvonne's change in expression and quickly asked with a smile, Is this the sister-in-law? Yvonne was about to affirm when Kieran shook his head with a smile, No, she's my friend, not his woman. Yvonne tightened her grip on Kieran's arm, visibly upset. Ruth's eyes widened in surprise, wondering who could be Kieran's significant other if not this beautiful woman. Kieran didn't dwell on the women's reactions, suggesting, let's head upstairs. Okay, of course. Ruth stepped aside to let Kieran lead the way. With a hint of indescribable complexity in her eyes, Yvonne followed Kieran upstairs. 
The two women, flanking Kieran on either side, presented an eye-catching picture of matched elegance. Inside the banquet hall, Lucia Jensen's voice echoed with arrogance. My daughter has established her own film company aiming to build a film base and produce movies. The company initially plans to invest $1 billion. Once established, investment sizes will vary depending on the movie projects. We intend to shape the future of Dragon's Land's film industry, highlighting the unique traits of actors and pursuing a distinct path in filmmaking. The business model of Mystic or Enterprise is outdated, and their talent recruitment and management are far behind the current trends. Such a company has no future or hope. Acting for such a company, be wary that today's earnings might vanish tomorrow if it goes bankrupt. Lucia spoke like an orator, endlessly proclaiming her statements. Bianca stood by, dressed in a white chiffon gown that shone under the light, making her appear exceptionally radiant. Her natural haughty expression enhanced her beauty, making her quite distinctive. A slight body movement would cause her graceful figure to sway, showcasing her exquisite curves. Her appearance, from her delicate brows and eyes to her petite nose and cheeks, exuded a womanly beauty and charm, seductive and alluring. From the crowd emerged a woman in her thirties, dressed flamboyantly. The woman wore a purple evening gown, her light yellow hair cascading down her back. Her curvy figure, accentuated by a matching gown waistband, made her appear voluptuous and enticing. Such maturity, beauty, and composure in a woman could captivate any man for a long time, making her unforgettable. Are you really establishing a company? The woman asked, stepping forward. The crowd turned their gaze towards her. The woman in the purple gown, with her voluptuous figure, stepped forward, exuding a seductive charm. Especially notable was her waist, tied with a ribbon matching her gown, emphasizing her perfect curves. Mature, beautiful, composed, such a woman could keep a man's attention indefinitely, proving to be an unforgettable sight. The most memorable aspect was her lips, slightly larger and fuller, easily igniting a man's fantasies. Isn't that the actress Sue Nathan? It's Sue Nathan! We didn't see Sue Nathan at the auditions today. Could she have been pre-selected? The crowd gasped in surprise, with many looking up to her in admiration. Sue Nathan, having been a celebrated actress a few years ago, was well known to everyone. However, in this era of rapid internet growth and the fast pace of creating stars, even a beauty with talent like Sue couldn't withstand the surge of newcomers. Now, at 27, Sue found herself in a situation where roles were scarce. Some companies wanted to recruit her, but often with the condition of sleeping with the boss first, which Sue always refused. This naturally narrowed her opportunities. Coming to Fox this time, she hoped to strive for a chance, only to arrive later than Starly White and after everything had ended. However, her reputation secured an invitation from Shuri to attend tonight's banquet. Hearing Lucia's proud announcement about establishing a film company piqued her interest. Although unfamiliar with the details, Sue saw an opportunity to present herself, hoping that a company led by a woman might not harbor so many unwritten rules. Thus, she stepped forward. Recognized by the crowd, Sue nodded in greeting with a smile. My idol, actress Sue Nathan. Bianca screamed and was about to rush over when Lucia held her back, her face full of pride. Chapter. Our film company was initially set up with a fund of one billion. If best actress Sue Nathan is willing to sign immediately, we're prepared to raise the initial funds to two billion, and even adding another billion directly for a movie starring Sue Nathan. Lucia looked towards Sue, her smile exuding confidence and dominance as if the company was already established. Her statement was grandiose, but it shocked Sue and everyone else. This was a full-scale invitation for Sue to join. They were willing to triple the investment for her. A display of absolute abundance and assertiveness. For a company just starting out, this was a demonstration of financial strength and a strong message, sure to stir a massive wave in the film industry. Bianca was astonished at her mother's audacity. One billion already seemed a lot, and now her mother was talking about investing three billion. But remembering the ten billion on her card, three. Billion didn't seem much, giving her full confidence and pride. At that moment, she felt not just wealthy, but truly a CEO, capable of determining others' fates, even life and death. She felt elated. Her gaze, filled with pride, landed on Starly White in the crowd. Starly was wearing a white evening gown, standing gracefully among the attendees, her bare shoulders and smooth back perfectly displaying the beautiful lines of a woman's figure. Standing under the light, her delicate neck was as white as ivory, her skin flawless, her cheeks flushed with a soft, rosy hue, and her beautiful lips lightly tinted red, slightly parted to reveal her white teeth, a sight so enticing it could make any woman long for a closer look. Thinking that Starly achieved the highest score under Kieran's care, becoming tonight's most dazzling star and a sure recruit. 
Compared to Starley, she felt no less in terms of looks or family background. And she had money. Why should she fail? Was it all because of Kieran? Her heart was filled with intense resentment. She glanced at Starley, then addressed the others present. Doesn't everyone know the unspoken rules of today's Mysticor Enterprise auditions? Even if it's best actress Sue Nathan auditioning, success isn't guaranteed. Her gaze then fell on Sue. A powerful actress like best actress Sue Nathan ultimately can't overcome those women willing to go all the way with no bottom line. What can anyone do about it? I've lost, now I can only rely on myself but others. Bianca's words, filled with sarcasm, were directed at Starley. The other women auditioning also looked over. While they praised Starley's naturally perfect S-figure and smooth skin, their hearts were filled with envy and jealousy. Especially Lulu Reynolds, who initially thought she would be the leading lady, but Starley's arrival relegated her to second place, potentially even losing her chance entirely, naturally stirring her anger. She gently swayed her waist and stepped forward. Bianca is right. No matter how excellent we are, we can't beat those willing to accept the unspoken rules. Hearing Lulu Reynolds speak up, many others felt their resentment flare. Is it just because they dared to get close to Kieran? If not for daring to be close to Kieran, they wouldn't have had a chance, Bianca continued. This undoubtedly added fuel to the fire, intensifying the anger. Only fools would get close to Kieran. The York family is finished, gone. What can Kieran alone do? Lucia sneered contemptuously. That disgusting guy, he's always been scheming to get my daughter, but I've been staunchly against it. Lucia scanned the crowd. Don't be bullied by that bastard. He's nothing but a dead pervert. Her disdain for Kieran stemmed from deep anger and hatred, blaming him for her daughter's failure. Lulu Reynolds and others' faces turned even uglier. Sue, however, slightly frowned at Lucia's harsh words. By this time, Starley had already heard the side comments from her friends, Esther Ellen and Zarak So. Unwilling to let such insults slide, she started moving towards Lucia. Bianca's gaze fell on Starley's delicate legs, slender and captivating, especially when glimpses of her beautifully pedicured feet peeked out from under her dress, her toes like fresh lily petals. The nail polish gleaming red, charming and cute. This only deepened Bianca's envy and resentment. Starley is coming over. Let's give her some face, shall we? Bianca mentioned with a smirk that incited further anger among the crowd. Seeing Starley looking purer and more beautiful than her own daughter, and with a first-place ranking, ignited further rage in Lucia, who then confronted her. So, you're the woman Kieran's keeping? Lucia's voice was loud, ensuring the entire banquet hall heard her. All eyes turned to Lucia and Starley. Starley's face flushed red with the directness of the question, angering her to the point of speechlessness. Kieran, that little jerk, dares to keep a woman. Lucia looked at Starley with a cold laugh. And you, to think you're low enough to want to be kept by Kieran? You're wasting your beauty. Starley was momentarily at a loss when facing someone as vulgar as Lucia for the first time. Is it because he didn't choose to keep your daughter that you're jealous and resentful? Esther Ellen couldn't stand it any longer and stepped forward to defend Starley. What's it to you? Lucia retorted angrily. If Kieran were willing to keep women, I'd be the first to go, Zarak So chimed in, stepping forward in support. You shameless women. Lucia was furious, not expecting anyone to stand so firmly with Kieran. I'd like to be kept too, Ruth Sutton's voice suddenly rang out. Without even looking to see who spoke, Lucia shouted back, You're all a bunch of shameless women, all of you. Get out, Manager Jang stepped forward, his voice booming with anger. Chapter 624 Lucia trembled in fear, hastily gazing at Manager Zhang. Unfamiliar with Manager Zhang, Bianca furrowed her brows and angrily rebuked, Who do you think you are? I am the manager of the Seasons Hotel, Manager Zhang replied, his face turning ashen. In his eyes, Lucia and Bianca were just two fools. Don't be angry, Manager Zhang. What I just said was about those shameless women, Lucia, aware that this was a property of the Sutton family, hurriedly spoke in a flattering tone, not daring to offend. A low-ranking official at the doorstep of a prime minister still commands respect, and though Manager Zhang was merely a hotel manager, working for the Sutton family made him untouchable for them. Get out! Manager Zhang dismissed them, uninterested in further discussion. Repeatedly being told to leave, Lucia's face flushed with embarrassment. Young and unaware of the intricacies, Bianca couldn't bear the humiliation and stood up straight, retorting, What are you as a manager? How would your business continue without customers like us patronizing the Seasons Hotel? If the Seasons Hotel shuts down, you, as the manager, would be the first to be out. Feeling her scolding wasn't enough, Bianca continued. Call your boss over, have them talk to me. 
If you don't apologize to me and my mom today, I'll make sure the Seasons Hotel can't continue to operate. At that moment, Bianca seemed incredibly imposing. Originally very nervous, Lucia found her daughter's outburst somewhat reasonable. A manager is not a Sutton family member. What's so great about that? Now a billionaire, she felt powerful in Fox and across the country. She stood tall, her gaze at the manager filled with pride and contempt, waiting for the boss to come for a proper discussion. I am the boss. Speak up if you have something to say. Otherwise leave, Ruth stepped forward, her words just as direct. The crowd's attention turned to Ruth especially after her remark about wanting to be kept. Manager Zhang quickly apologized. I'm sorry, Miss Sutton. Ruth gestured for Manager Zhang to step back and looked at Lucia and Bianca. This season's hotel is mine and I too wish to be kept by Kieran. What do you think? Hello, Miss Sutton. Esther Ellen and Zara Elo promptly came forward to greet her. After learning Ruth had personally cooked for Kieran, they had been eager to apologize, hoping to be allowed to dine here again. Without today's banquet, they likely wouldn't have made it inside. Ruth glanced at Esther and Zara. You two did well just now. You can come here to dine in the future. Thank you, Miss Sutton. Thank you. The two women, thrilled to be forgiven, paid no mind to the onlookers, thanking her repeatedly as if they had won a great prize. They understood this acknowledgement greatly closed the distance between them and Ruth, bringing them closer to the Sutton family. Ruth's gaze returned to Lucia and Bianca, continuing, This is a Sutton family enterprise, so from now on you no longer have the privilege to dine here. You may leave now. Ha! As if there's nowhere else to eat besides your place, Bianca said, unfazed and full of disdain. Lucia became anxious, aware of what it meant to offend the Sutton family, potentially hindering the Campbell family's ability to thrive or even move in Fox. She turned to Bianca and snapped, Shut up! Unaware the hotel belonged to the Suttons, Bianca retorted in annoyance, Mom, what are you saying? Apologize to Miss Sutton immediately, Lucia commanded loudly without explanation. Why should I apologize when I've done nothing wrong? Bianca was thoroughly infuriated. What's the big deal about not dining at the Seasons Hotel? If you talk nonsense again, I'll beat you to death. Seeing Ruth's cold expression, Lucia became utterly enraged and raised her hand to strike Bianca. Bianca, shocked her mother would actually hit her, forgot to dodge. Auntie Lucia, why bother? Kieran's voice rang out, his hand raised, catching Lucia's hand just as it was about to land on Bianca's face. Bianca is still young and doesn't understand, Kieran continued. Hearing Kieran's words, Lucia reacted like a cat's tail had been stepped on. Remembering everything was because of Kieran, she flew into a rage. You shameless scoundrel, I'll kill you! She swung her other hand towards Kieran. Kieran, naturally, wouldn't let himself be hit. He released Lucia's hand and quickly stepped back. Kill this bastard! Bianca, ungrateful to Kieran, instead advanced with curses. However, as Lucia swung at Kieran and missed, her body's inertia caused her slap to land squarely on Bianca's face instead. With a loud, crisp smack carrying all of Lucia's anger and hatred, it was many times heavier than the slap she initially intended to deliver. Ah, Bianca cried out in pain, her ears ringing, blood flowing from her mouth corner. Bianca. Seeing her daughter struck, Lucia rushed forward with a pained expression to help Bianca. Whimpering, Bianca cried out in humiliation and pain. Lucia turned, angrily glaring at Kieran. You little bastard. It's all your fault my daughter was hit. Ha! Yvonne chuckled lightly. You really have no shame. Kieran stopped you from hitting your daughter, sparing you some dignity. You didn't appreciate it and even tried to retaliate against Kieran. When you failed and hit your own daughter instead, you blame Kieran. Your skin is thick indeed. You, who are you? What's it to you? Lucia, distressed for her daughter and seeing Yvonne again, couldn't help but yell at her. I'm also a woman seeking Kieran's patronage. Do you have a problem with that? Yvonne looked as if ready to infuriate someone to death. Forget it. Kieran looked at Yvonne. He approached Lucia. Auntie Lucia, let me take care of Bianca. He reached out towards Bianca's face, wanting to help reduce the swelling. Slap. Lucia slapped Kieran's hand away. Stop pretending here. You just want to take advantage of my daughter. Kieran was left speechless. Kieran, I am all yours. Starly White boldly stepped forward upon seeing Kieran, feeling bolstered. Honey, I want to carry your child. I am yours anytime too, Yvonne added. I also welcome Kieran to take advantage of me, Ruth chimed in, her cheeks flushed. Lucia's face was full of astonishment. What charm does Kieran have? Kieran, you're nothing. Bianca couldn't contain her fury and shouted at Kieran. Chapter. Lucia was seething with anger. She stood up straight, looked at Kieran, and said angrily, 
Kiran, don't think you can win a woman's heart just because you're a pretty boy. My daughter, Bianca, is not someone you can look up to or obtain. She stood tall and proud, pointing at Sue. See this? This is the movie queen Sue Nathan, who is about to sign with my daughter's film and television company. Pointing at Lulu, she continued, She also disapproves of your unspoken rules and is ready to sign with my daughter's film and television company. Lucia stood arrogantly. From now on, Fox will have a new film and television company, and the CEO will be Bianca, a woman you'll look up to for the rest of your life but will never get. Unable to bear being humiliated, Lucia wanted to use this way to regain her dignity. Kieran looked at Sue. He had never seen this woman before. He had been in the mountains previously, oblivious to movie queens and celebrities. As for Lulu, he had only seen her today, barely leaving an impression. Are you guys starting a company? Shuri's voice sounded. Yes, we're going to start our own company and won't accept your unspoken rules anymore. Lucia looked towards the beautiful and enchanting Shuri, getting even more irritated, and huffily asked, Are you also being kept by Kieran? Me? Shuri's face suddenly turned red. Then she gave a wry smile and shook her head. I won't have that chance in this lifetime. Lucia, not understanding the reason, sneered. It's good that you know you're ugly. Then looking at Kieran, she said, You're just interested in our Bianca, wanting to get her, right? The beautiful Bianca would never marry you. Keep dreaming. Shuri's eyebrows furrowed tightly, and she looked at Lucia with a cold smile. It seems you're mistaken. Mistaken about what? Lucia asked angrily. My brother-in-law already has a wife. Why would he be interested in your Bianca? Shuri's gaze landed on Bianca. Whether it's figure or looks, she's not as good as my sister. In terms of family power, Mysticor Enterprise is Bayville's top company and still can't compare to my sister. Why would my brother-in-law want your daughter? Your, your brother-in-law. Lucia looked at Shuri in astonishment, as did everyone else on the scene, especially Yvonne and Starley. Kieran didn't expect Shuri to reveal this matter, let alone refer to him as her brother-in-law, making him feel a bit awkward and helpless. Ha ha. Bianca laughed out loud. Kieran, Kieran, so you're a man who lives off a woman. Can't get from the Campbell family, so you go after the Fox family? I am really amazed by you. Lucia also came to a realization, looking at Kieran and sneering. Right, there's only you left in the York family. It's impossible for the York family to rise again, so you just found a woman and became a live in son-in-law. She looked arrogantly at everyone present. Our family is establishing a film and television company. To show our strength, the registered capital will be increased to five billion, and the first film will have an investment of one billion. Those who want to join the company can come over now. She wanted to use this action to slap Kieran and Shuri in the face. Even if the Mysticor Enterprise is powerful, what about it? They wouldn't spend a fortune to make stars, but she wanted to use this hype to tell everyone that they were willing to spend big. Many auditioning women showed joy on their faces, seeing this as a rare opportunity. I'm willing to sign with your company, said Lulu, worried about missing out, and immediately went over first. Welcome. Bianca extended her hand proudly, not forgetting to provoke Kieran. Thank you, CEO Campbell, Lulu said happily, shaking hands with Bianca in gratitude. Hearing herself being addressed as CEO Campbell, Bianca felt very pleased, her face full of joy and pride, as if she had already established the company. She looked arrogantly at Kieran, the scorn in her eyes extremely thick. Shuri's eyebrows moved slightly as she surveyed the crowd. Is anyone else interested in signing with their company? If so, you can go now. The crowd fell into silence, with many beginning to ponder. Sue, aren't you coming? Lulu called out. Sue, if you come, we'll immediately invest one billion and let you be the lead actress, Lucy attempted. Sue's beautiful oval face was pensive, her gaze sweeping back and forth between Kieran and Lucia a few times, before she finally shook her head at Lucia, refusing, I'm sorry. You? You also want to plead with Kieran? You couldn't possibly be hoping to be kept by him, could you? Lucia, hearing the refusal, was very annoyed and mocked. Sue's expression turned sour. Please watch your words. My refusal is because I do not admire your character. What, what did you say? Lucia angrily questioned. Your character is problematic. Kieran has not spoken ill of you despite your continuous humiliation of him, which is utterly baseless. For someone like you, I worry there would be a lot of trouble with a contract in the future. Sue, through years of ups and downs in the film industry, had seen a lot and wouldn't have spoken up if not provoked by Lucia. Lucia, hearing this assessment, blushed with anger, left utterly humiliated. Hmm. If you all wish to plead with Kieran, go ahead. Just don't forget Mysticor Enterprise is planning to sign Starly White, the woman who wants to be kept by Kieran. You're nothing compared to her, Bianca arrogantly rebuked Sue. Sue remained silent, uninterested in contention or seeking attention. Kieran, however, had an appreciation for this woman, beautiful, low-profile, and substantial. 
Bianca, seeing Kieran's gaze towards Sue, felt disgusted, convinced he was interested in Sue. Sue, just wait. I bet Kieran will sleep with you tonight. Sue trembled slightly, her face showing surprise as she looked at Kieran. Kieran had already withdrawn his gaze, looking towards Shuri. Shuri, looking at Bianca with a cold smile, asked, So, all the people we recruit have to be exploited by Sir York? Do you think not? Bianca coldly countered. Shuri turned to address everyone who came for the audition today, according to Master York's arrangement. All of you auditioning today will be signed up by Mysticor Enterprise. The venue fell silent, the news not immediately sinking in. After a few seconds, Esther and Zara burst into excited exclamations, hugging each other tightly. We've finally become actors. Ah, uh, the others followed suit, reacting with their own bursts of excitement. They had never dreamed they would all be recruited. This was somewhat unexpected. Bianca was stunned. The most dumbfounded was Lulu, who thought she wouldn't be recruited and thus wanted to join Bianca's yet-to-exist company, eagerly ingratiating herself. Now, she was filled with regret. Lucia was also dismayed but quickly reacted, angrily yelling at the jubilant crowd, So what if you're all recruited? If you play minor roles, you'll never become famous. Lulu, our company will cast you as the lead actress investing one billion in a movie. Bianca made an empty promise. Lulu's mood somewhat stabilized. Lucia turned to Kieran. You'll never compare to us. Kieran smiled, looking at Shuri. I'm investing a hundred billion in the company. Create a starring role for each woman based on her unique traits. The room fell into a deathly silence. Chapter. Investing a hundred billion. Each of them would be starring in a movie. Kieran is so domineering. Kieran is so generous. Thank you, young Master York. Esther and Zara were the first to react, loudly expressing their gratitude towards Kieran. Thank you, young Master York. The others followed suit in giving thanks. At this moment, everyone felt like they had regained something precious, overwhelmed with joy. Lucia and Bianca, on the other hand, were as frustrated, as if they had swallowed something foul. Kieran seemed like an indestructible presence, their natural nemesis always outstanding in front of them, making them detest him to the bone, yet powerless to do anything about it. Fift! Kieran is just bluffing. Where would he get a hundred billion? Lucia didn't believe it and angrily rebuked. Hearing this, the crowd's expression changed, regaining their composure, also realizing that a hundred billion was not a sum to be mentioned lightly. It might as well be underworld money, Bianca sneered with pride. Just as Kieran was about to speak, he saw a commotion at the door with people scattering. Then he saw Joe Queen, the right elder of the Lions Club, approaching with others. Lucia, seeing Joe and recalling his kneeling to Kieran earlier, speculated he was here for revenge and said to Kieran, Your retribution is coming. Kieran smiled, paying no heed. Joe, seeing Kieran, quickened his pace, ran over, and respectfully handed a check to Kieran. Young Master York, this is the 200 billion Rory Yates lost in a bet. It can be cashed at the bank tomorrow. Thud, thud. Those following behind even knelt down to Kieran, respectful, polite, hiss. The entire crowd gasped in shock and disbelief, unable to fathom what they were witnessing. You, are you guys mistaken? Lucia felt her worldview being overturned again and couldn't help but ask. Kieran took the check, turned around and handed it to Shuri, withdraw a hundred billion tomorrow and invest it in the company. Shuri's face was filled with shock. Excitedly taking the check, she looked at Lucia. Do you believe we're investing a hundred billion now? Lucia's face turned red, left speechless. My brother-in-law didn't come to our family to be alive and son-in-law. With a hundred billion, what woman can't he marry? It's my sister who wants to live off him, to be kept by him, Shuri said with a cold laugh towards Bianca. Bianca's face felt hotter and more uncomfortable than if she had been slapped by her own mother. Thinking of the hundred billion, she felt as if her life's dreams were shattering. That amount of money was more than she could spend in a lifetime, but now she had nothing. Slap. Standing aside, Lulu, without any warning, raised her hand and slapped Bianca across the face. A person like you running a company would surely run it into the ground. Idiot. Bianca's face turned red from the slap, a burning pain. Lulu, full of regret, put on a sycophantic smile towards Kieran, cooing, Young Master York, I was just acting undercover just now. I wanted to sign with Mysticor Enterprise now. Is that okay? As she spoke. She batted her eyelashes seductively her body going limp as if she was about to fall into Kieran's arms, ready to be exploited, ready to be kept. I'm sorry, you no longer have a chance. Shuri, not waiting for Kieran to refuse, coldly stated. You. Lulu was somewhat angry but didn't dare to lash out, looking towards Kieran. Mysticor Enterprise only signs actors with integrity. We don't want the likes of you and Bianca. 
Shuri ruthlessly rejected. Lulu's face was filled with despair, which then turned to anger. She turned to Bianca and slapped her twice more. Damn it! You've ruined me! Bianca screamed in agony. Fuming, Lulu stormed out as if she had just missed out on a $5 million prize. In reality, she knew she had missed out on potentially billions in investment. A hit movie starring her could have made her famous. But because of Bianca and Lucia's deception, she saw her hopes and future dashed, deeply hurt and depressed. You can go now, Kieran said to Joe. Thank you, young Master York. Joe, as if granted amnesty, quickly got up. Those behind him also stood up, thanking Kieran repeatedly. As Joe walked past Lucia, he unexpectedly slapped her, crisp and loud, taking everyone by surprise. Lucia screamed in pain. Your retribution has arrived, Joe said expressionlessly. Lucia's face burned with pain, but fear kept her from speaking out. Instead, she forced a smile on her face. The Lions Club was not to be provoked. Get out, Joe barked angrily. Terrified, Lucia quickly turned and ran, her face pale with fear. Bianca turned to look at Kieran, her heart filled with anger and frustration. Thinking of the phrase, I am master my fate, she silently vowed to get her revenge. Lucia and Bianca were both hit, but it was a result of their own doing. Kieran hadn't intended to lay a hand on them. Their own ignorance led to their downfall. After the mother and daughter left, the atmosphere at the party became quiet and then quickly harmonious again. People approached to thank Kieran, but they were stopped by Shuri. Kieran sat quietly in a corner, with Yvonne and Starley accompanying him. He quietly drank his juice and ate from the buffet, his demeanor elegant and gentlemanly, radiating an indescribable charisma. Both women were captivated by him, but they knew he was not meant for them. Thinking of snow made them feel even worse. Sue Nathan, from a distance, quietly observed Kieran. She was full of interest and curiosity about him. Kieran felt Sue's gaze but chose to ignore it, pretending not to see. For him, he didn't want to get too involved with these women. However, interactions between men and women are sometimes inevitable. Like now, despite his indifference towards Sue, there were still women seeking him out. Esther and Zara approached Kieran like two blooming flowers. Young Master York, we, we have something to tell you. Is it convenient for you? Kieran nodded slightly. Yvonne and Starley stood up and went elsewhere. The two women sat down, exchanging glances. Finally gathering her courage, Esther said, Ruby Lachlan is getting engaged tomorrow. She told us that if she can't change this fate, she'll commit suicide. Suicide? Kieran's expression changed slightly, Ruby's image surfacing in his mind. He looked at the juice in front of him, thinking of the life and death love potion. Seeing Kieran's silence, Zara anxiously said, Young Master York, Ruby loves you very much. Can you help her? She doesn't want to marry the other party. She only wants to marry you. Esther also nodded. Yes, if it really can't be changed, with Ruby's determined nature, she'll definitely choose suicide. Who is she marrying? Kieran asked. We don't know. Both women shook their heads. Kieran frowned, questioning what kind of friends they were. Really? Seems like a big family alliance marriage, Esther explained. I want to see Ruby Lachlan tomorrow, Kieran said to Esther. Chapter 627. Esther's beautiful influencer face first showed shock, then was filled with joy. That's great. I'll take you to Ruby's home tomorrow. I'm coming too, Zara followed. All right, I'll wait for you at Mysticore Enterprise, Kieran agreed. Both women nodded excitedly, their eyes sparkling with delight and anticipation. They wanted to talk more with Kieran, but seeing him start to drink his juice, ignoring them, they left feeling slightly disappointed. Esther, sensing the cue, smiled politely. Young Master York will leave first, not to disturb you. Young Master York, goodbye, Zara waved her hand. Both women were beautiful and knew how to charm, but it was of no use. Kieran nodded. The two women got up and left. Kieran didn't say anything, already contemplating Ruby's family, the Lachlans. At that moment, Ruth approached. Seeing Esther and Zara had left, she greeted, Young Master York, Kieran pointed to the seat opposite. I was just looking for you. Ruth was delighted, sitting down while asking, What did you want to see me about, young Master York? Do you know about Ruby Lachlan's family? Kieran asked directly. Ruby Lachlan's family? The Lachlans? Ruth's expression changed slightly, seeming a bit displeased. What's wrong? These days, my father has been pondering where his poisoning came from, suspecting the Lachlan family. Ruth faced Kieran, not lying. Kieran, thinking of Ruby's life and death love potion, knew that woman was from the Maui tribe, or at least a descendant. Given that Gordon was poisoned, it was easy to suspect her. 
but regarding this matter he didn't say much, partly because he didn't know much, and partly because Ruby wasn't involved with poisoning, so it definitely had nothing to do with her. Seeing Kira not continuing on her topic, Ruth quickly redirected her thoughts, continuing, The Lachlans are a mysterious family in Fox. Mysterious? Ruth nodded. They arrived in Fox almost at the same with the establishment of Mysticor Enterprise. At the same time? Kieran was shocked again. Ruth's beautiful face carried a thoughtful look. About twenty years ago, when the biggest family in Fox was our Sutton family, first came Sawyer Sinfield. He started investing here, quickly becoming prominent, catching the attention of many in Fox. Kieran listened without interrupting, letting her continue. Ruth brushed her hair, her fair arms shining under the light, radiating a charm that made one want to hold and caress them, irresistibly captivating. Ruth was beautiful and charming, just not in Kieran's eyes. Seeing Kieran's expressionless face, Ruth slightly regretted but continued. While everyone started paying attention to Mystic or Enterprise, the Lachlan family opened an inconspicuous clinic in Fox, a clinic that primarily practiced traditional medicine. She looked at Kieran. If compared today, it should be considered Maui medicine. Regardless, their methods of treating and saving people were very miraculous, quickly stabilizing their footing in Fox and rapidly developing. Kieran seemed very interested, looking at Ruth, signaling her to continue. Ruth went on, I only heard about the situation at the time, but I know their family's head was very skilled in medicine, quickly making money and gaining a good reputation in Fox through his miraculous healing. Mysticor Enterprise worked hard to make money, but they didn't earn as quickly as treating and saving people did. The Lachlan family not only stabilized in Fox, but also gained the support and love of many Fox residents, slowly becoming a powerful family, rivaling the Suttons. Ruth paused, looking at Kieran. Kieran nodded slightly, treating and saving people. Many wealthy individuals would spend a fortune. Yes, that's the biggest advantage, Ruth laughed. I bet many wealthy people offer more than 20 million. Hearing her tease about giving him 20 million for medical fees, Kieran wasn't bothered. If you think it was too little, you can always give more. My dad said if you marry me, all our family's wealth will be yours, Ruth said softly, blushing at the same time. Let's continue the previous topic. Kieran looked at an expectant Ruth, promptly steering the conversation back. Ruth was disappointed. Three years ago, when my father had just become the city's mayor, he visited the Lachlan family for research, which was essentially a promotion for them. After coming back, he started experiencing severe headaches that worsened over time. That's why we suspect they poisoned him. Kieran listened silently, seemingly pondering the connection. Ruth waited, looking at Kieran, ready for any questions. Do you know Ruby? Kieran suddenly asked. Ruth's expression changed, becoming somewhat unnatural. You know Ruby? Seeing Ruth's surprised and shocked expression, Kieran knew she must know her. You must be quite close. Ruth pondered for a moment, nodding. Very close. She looked up at Kieran with a hint of complexity. We have been classmates since elementary school, all the way to high school. Ruth chuckled bitterly, self-deprecatingly saying, however, she was always the school beauty and I was just the class beauty. Kieran couldn't help but chuckle at Ruth's expression. Ruth's face turned red with embarrassment, looking up at Kieran with a gaze full of charm. What are you laughing at? You women are really interesting, always comparing with each other. Kieran shook his head, smiling. A woman dresses for the one who pleases her. Don't you know this truth? Ruth inquired. Fine. I won't meddle in your affairs. Kieran picked up his juice and took a sip. You know Ruby? Ruth looked at Kieran, probing. I've met her once. She was about to get married, didn't want to, and asked me for help. Kieran didn't lie. You're going to break up her marriage. Ruth was shocked. Not exactly. I just want to tell the Lachlan family that a forced marriage isn't sweet. Isn't that the same thing? I advise you not to get involved. The Lachlan family is very domineering, and your involvement might disturb your peace. Ruth expressed concern. I happen to be free for the next five days, so I'll look into this matter. Kieran had already made up his mind. Seeing she couldn't change his mind, Ruth didn't say anything further, showcasing her intelligence by not becoming a nuisance to Kieran. However, she had already decided to visit the Lachlan family with Kieran the next day. The banquet on Kieran's side continued normally. In the Lions Club's living room, a man of extraordinary status had just arrived. Chapter 628. Inspector Locker, hello! Charlie and others greeted the man with respect. Even Faber showed a respectful demeanor. The man sat in the main seat of the living room, a spot usually reserved for Max Yates. Even in Max's absence, Charlie dared not sit there, as it symbolized power and dignity. However, Inspector Locker sitting there appeared utterly calm and natural, exuding an air of absolute authority. Especially his sharp brows and piercing eyes sent shivers down one's spine. 
Inspector Locker, named Cliff Locker, is responsible for monitoring the personnel and quality of the Imperial Dragon's operatives. He functions like an ancient inspector, assessing each of the Imperial Dragon's branches annually, making adjustments and assignments. He holds significant power. Cliff is known for his no-nonsense approach, often executing those who make mistakes on the spot and replacing them immediately. There was an instance in Fox's Lion Gate where he found some members lacking in skills and dedication. Cliff had Max kneel and explain in front of thousands of Lions Club members. The humiliation was extreme for Max, but he dared not utter a word. In the end, Max personally executed those underperformers to appease Cliff and secure his position. Thus, to the people of Liangate, Cliff is akin to the Grim Reaper, hoping he would never come. His arrival this time has made Charlie and others anxious, knowing it was because of the reports regarding Kieran. When will Max come out of seclusion? Cliff asked coldly. We're not sure, but we've already reported your arrival to Chairman Yates, Charlie hastily explained. Can he handle Kieran when he comes out? Cliff continued. Charlie's expression changed, quickly looking at Faber for his opinion. Cliff's gaze landed on Faber. Your martial arts have improved significantly. Thank you for the compliment, Inspector Locker, Faber humbly replied. Do you think Max is a match for Kieran? Cliff asked emotionlessly again. Faber's mouth twitched slightly, and after a moment he shook his head. He's not a match for Kieran. What? Joe couldn't help but exclaim, surprised that even their leader wasn't a match. Cliff's expression darkened, clearly very dissatisfied with the answer. Faber, however, was very firm, emphasizing again, he's really not a match for Kieran. Seems like Elder Faber has been scared out of his wits, Cliff sneered, displeasure evident in his eyes. Inspector Locker's criticism is valid, but it's true that he's not a match for Kieran. Faber's mind was still filled with the image of Kieran defeating ghosts, firmly holding this view. Elder Faber, please explain clearly, Charlie urged, worried that Cliff might become angry. After a moment of contemplation, Faber began, I saw with my own eyes. Faber recounted the events that had transpired at the Sutton estate that day. Upon hearing this, Charlie and Joe's expressions drastically changed. They finally understood why Faber had always avoided direct confrontation with Kieran. Kieran had become so powerful that Faber stood no chance against him. Thinking back on their own arrogance, they couldn't help but mock themselves internally, though they were also somewhat irritated that Faber had known this but hadn't spoken up. Cliff, however, coldly laughed. So, you've all been scared out of your wits like this. The three men said nothing, their expressions conveying a shared sentiment. After all, Kieran had decimated the Panthergate and Wolfgate, demonstrating strength that was no joke. Hearing that Faber couldn't handle the ghosts that Kieran could easily kill only added to their shock. Seeing the three men not responding, Cliff's expression darkened further. Tell Max Yates to come out of seclusion tomorrow and personally challenge Kieran. Charlie, upon hearing this, dared not object and immediately nodded. Yes. Cliff fell silent, not speaking further. Charlie and the others immediately began to arrange accommodations and notify Max. Faber, catching the intent behind Cliff's gaze, quickly understood his plan was to use Max to gauge Kieran's martial abilities. Was Max being considered a sacrificial pawn? This thought crossed Faber's mind. Cliff retired to rest. Charlie went to inform Max. At this moment, Max slowly opened his eyes, having been informed of the situation. He had surveillance in the living room linked to his secret training chamber. Usually, small matters could not affect him. However, today's events, including his son being beaten and forced to pay compensation, had distracted him. Now, with Cliff's arrival and the task given, he knew he had to come out and kill Kieran. Of course, he was also eager to personally eliminate Kieran. Arrogance leads to death. Unaware of the Imperial Dragon's arrival and their intent to kill him, Kieran considered Starley's lack of accommodation after the banquet and decided to take her to the Fox Hill Villa to stay. Starley was delighted. Yvonne felt a tinge of regret, realizing her opportunity to seduce Kieran had vanished. After returning, the three of them rested for the night. The next morning, Kieran got up, quickly got ready, and headed to Mysticor Enterprise. As he arrived at the company's entrance, he saw Esther and Zara waiting by a white Maserati. Esther was dressed in a white dress, appearing rather innocent, while Zara wore an O.L. office lady's suit, exuding the charm of a white-collar beauty. The two women standing there attracted a lot of attention, but they carried themselves with pride, ignoring the stares. Upon seeing Kieran, the two women, like bees spotting nectar, happily ran over to him, standing across from him. Good morning, young Master York, Kieran nodded slightly. You're early. The women, pleased with the compliment, beamed with joy. Let's go, Kieran said. Right away, young Master York. The two were thrilled to follow Kieran to the car. 
Esther took the initiative to open the car door for Kieran. As Kieran got in, he noticed breakfast ready in the back seat, consisting of milk, bread, sandwiches, and fried eggs. Young Master York, we, we made breakfast for you. It might not be much, but we hope you like it, Zara said shyly, her face flushing with embarrassment. Kieran, understanding the women's intentions and not wanting to snub their efforts, smiled and said, I haven't had breakfast yet, thank you. Hearing Kieran's gratitude, the two women were overjoyed, as excited as if they had won a $5 million prize, unsure how to respond. Their effort in getting up early to prepare wasn't in vain. Kieran started to eat. Although the taste was average, he appreciated the effort behind it and graciously finished everything. The women, moved by his acceptance, had tears of happiness in their eyes. It's a classic tale of women admiring a hero. Even knowing they couldn't win Kieran's heart, they still longed to be closer to him. Well done, Kieran casually praised. Can we be your maids? Esther asked boldly. Kieran nearly spat out his drink at the question. Chapter 629. Kieran naturally turned down their requests to be his maid. Arriving at the Lachlan family's home, the two women turned to Kieran, young Master York, we've arrived. Looking at the ancient style architecture of the entrance, with green trees and flowers planted at the doorway, the whole scene appeared serene and inviting. The herbal shop was next to the Lachlan family's residence, the words miraculous healing on the signboard written in strong, vigorous strokes, exuding a domineering confidence in their medical skills. Kieran, smiling silently, took in the view. Although it was only just after nine in the morning, Many people were lined up at the door waiting to see a doctor. The medical skills of the Lachlan family are very good, Esther said, her influencer face blushing shyly. Not understanding the implication, Kieran furrowed his brows in confusion. What do you mean? It's just that. Esther hesitated to continue, looking towards Zara for help. Being somewhat more mature and bold, Zara spoke up. It's said that many men come here for treatment and then their lives become wonderful. Kieran chuckled lightly upon hearing this explanation a smile spreading across his face. Young Master York certainly doesn't need it, Esther said, her cheeks blushing. How do you know? Kieran asked curiously. Esther's face flushed to the roots of her neck, her eyes moist. I haven't even slept with my wife yet. Kieran thought about the love spell, feeling somewhat gloomy, and stepped out of the car. Esther and Zara looked at each other, their faces lighting up with joy as if seeing a glimmer of hope. However, they were curious about who Kieran's wife was. Kieran didn't head towards the main entrance, but towards the traditional Chinese medicine hall on the east side. Despite his stylish and dashing attire, nobody paid much attention to him, as most were busy seeking medical treatment. The discussions mostly centered around the Lachlan family's miraculous medical skills. Upon reaching the front, Kieran saw a middle-aged man about 40 years old, dressed in a white traditional Chinese outfit, taking a patient's pulse. The man, sitting there, exuded an imposing presence, commanding respect and admiration from everyone around. Kieran was slightly surprised, not because the man was taking a pulse, but because there seemed to be a thin red line, almost like a thread, entering the patient's body. Ordinary people wouldn't notice, much less see it. He instantly realized the man was using goo to diagnose the condition. This pulse-taking was merely for show. Kieran knew that in Maui, goo could be used to kill but was more often used for healing. He was curious to see how the man would treat the illness. After two minutes, the man withdrew his hand and told the patient, Recently, you've been waking up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, and you've also been experiencing abdominal pain seemingly due to indigestion. Yes, yes, yes. Doctor, you're exactly right, the patient said, overjoyed and quickly expressing gratitude. This condition is caused by a lack of gastrointestinal function. It's not a big problem. I.e., write you a prescription and you should be fine after taking it the man said, writing a prescription for a gastrointestinal soup. This prescription is commonly found in many traditional medicine books. However, the red thread-like goo he had left on the patient did not come out. The patient, unaware of it, thanked the doctor profusely before leaving. Kieran slightly furrowed his brows but remained silent. Then another patient sat down. Dr. Xavier, hello, after taking your medicine, I've improved a lot. As you instructed, I've come back for a follow-up after a month. Please check me again. Dr. Xavier nodded slightly without speaking, simply indicating for the patient to sit down and pretending to take the pulse again. Kieran was surprised to find a very fine, almost imperceptible red thread on the patient's arm, similar to the one on the previous patient who had left. This thread had been left behind previously, while the one on the departing patient had just been planted. Kieran's gaze swept over the other people, noticing many of them had such red threads on their bodies. He seemed to guess something but remained silent. All you need to do is come here once a month for medicine, 
Dr. Xavier said after checking, speaking with ease. Thank you, Dr. Xavier. The patient, hearing it was nothing serious, quickly expressed gratitude. Kieran's gaze fell on the patient's face, which showed no signs of illness. If one must say there was a problem, it would be the Giyu inside the patient's body, which needed to be controlled with medication. He became even more certain of his judgment. Thus, he walked to the registration desk, pretending to register. The woman in charge of registration was painting her nails red on one side while watching a video and laughing nonstop. I'd like to register for Dr. Xavier, Kieran said. Fifty dollars, the woman stated without looking up from her phone screen. Kieran paid the fifty and the woman registered him. The patient just diagnosed by Xavier came to pick up the monthly medication. The woman glanced at the prescription and casually said, Three hundred dollars. Okay, the patient agreed with a smile, handing over three red bills. The woman quickly processed the order and handed it to the patient, displaying high efficiency. The patient repeatedly expressed thanks. Kieran's lips curled slightly. A single appointment cost $50, and one prescription cost $300, totaling $350 per person. Looking at the queue of several hundred people, most transactions were like this, amounting to tens of thousands of dollars a day. While not a significant sum individually, the cumulative effect over time is substantial. This is a classic example of small contributions adding up to a large amount. He clearly saw the Lachlan family's money-making scheme poisoning, then treating to earn money, creating an endless cycle that turns patients into their workers. A single person could contribute thousands of dollars a year. With millions of residents in Fox City, plus others coming from afar, it was like a vampire with a gaping maw. Kieran's anger surged and he turned to the departing patient. Brother, what were you suffering from? The patient looked at Kieran, who was young, handsome, and dashing, and responded with a smile. I used to wake up from sleep sweating and having nightmares, causing my nerves to weaken, but I was cured here with their medicine. He held up his medicine. This medication is really effective. I spent tens of thousands in other hospitals without being cured, but here, I got better after just three doses. Now, I only need one dose a month. Dr. Xavier is truly a miracle worker. The patient praised the doctor. Hearing his words, many other patients started to share their stories. The medical skills of the Lachlan family are really miraculous. I had a disease that was considered incurable, but I was cured here. Having such miracle workers as the Lachlan family in Fox City is truly a blessing for us. The praises continued nonstop. While sitting there continuing his treatments, Xavier maintained a calm and natural demeanor, as if accustomed to such accolades. Kieran sneered internally, looking at Xavier. Is this patient still sick? Chapter 630. Whoosh. All eyes turned to Kieran, filled with surprise and confusion about his meaning. Moments later, many faces were marked with anger. Young man, what kind of way is that to speak? Show some respect to Dr. Xavier or your illness won't be cured. In Fox, if you have a terminal illness and Dr. Xavier doesn't intervene, you might as well wait to die. The crowd began to berate Kieran one after another. The patient Kieran had just called out coldly huffed at him. You look smart, yet you show no respect. After speaking, the patient quickly moved away from Kieran, as if to indicate he didn't know him and had no relation to him. Xavier didn't even lift his head, as if Kieran's words were meaningless. Facing the crowd's criticism, Kieran remained unfazed, continuing to focus on Xavier. Does this patient still have an illness? I know if I'm sick myself, the patient retorted angrily, annoyed by the repeated questioning. Xavier looked up at Kieran, his brows furrowed and eyes sharp with intense anger. Kieran met his gaze without a word, the two looking at each other in silence. After a few seconds, Xavier scoffed coldly. If you're not here for treatment, please leave. Right. Hurry up and go. Don't delay Dr. Xavier in treating patients. You're disrupting our treatment. If you don't leave, we'll call the police to take you away. The patients at the scene rebuked and tried to drive Kieran away. Kieran ignored them, continuing to question Xavier. I want to know, does this patient and many others in the crowd really have an illness? At first, Xavier didn't take him seriously, but upon hearing Kieran's words, his expression changed slightly, and he asked sternly, What are you trying to do? I want to smash your traditional medicine hall. Kieran pointed at the words miraculous healing with a commanding tone. Hearing this, everyone froze, not reacting. Young Master York! Esther and Zara, having parked their car, arrived just in time to hear his statement immediately calling out anxiously. As residents of Fox, they naturally knew of the Lachlan family's strength and had their concerns. Kieran paid them no heed, only looking at Xavier. If you can explain things clearly today, we can talk. If you can't, I'll have your medicine hall shut down. Oh, you'll have my medicine hall shut down? Xavier sneered, looking at Kieran with disdain. 
Using goo in treatment is one thing, Kieran focused on Xavier, but using goo to make money is unacceptable. Hearing this, Xavier's face whitened instantly, caught off guard. He stared sharply at Kieran for a few seconds, unable to discern anything unusual, and tried to appear calm, asking, Who are you? What nonsense are you spouting here? Bring out the person in charge of your family, Kieran demanded authoritatively. Ridiculous, Xavier shouted. Several young men rushed out surrounding Kieran, their faces filled with anger. Kid, are you looking to cause trouble? Kieran didn't respond but kept his focus on Xavier. Bring out the person in charge of your family now, or I'll smash your herbal shop. Get lost, the patients, disliking the disturbance, yelled at Kieran. Xavier's face was full of smugness as if mocking Kieran for his audacity to make such a bold statement in front of his patients. To him, Kieran appeared foolish for trying to assert himself there. After all, he considered himself a savior, even a messiah, to these people, who wouldn't want to curry favor with him. He coldly observed Kieran, treating him like a mere sideshow, no longer worth his attention. The people surrounding Kieran were rolling up their sleeves, preparing to take action. You don't think so? Kieran asked Xavier. Think what? Xavier scoffed. All right. With that, Kieran swiftly moved, passing by several patients who then felt as though something had brushed against them, and then something flying out of them. The people who surrounded Kieran suddenly began to clutch their bodies, screaming in pain. Everyone was startled, turning to look. Thud! Thud! Several of the Lachlan family's people fell to the ground, their bodies convulsing violently. What's happening? Someone asked in shock. Xavier's face paled, turning to Kieran. Did you poison them? Me poison? Kieran laughed coldly, pointing at the individuals he had touched. I merely forced out the goo poison from their bodies, which then landed on your people. Goo poison? The crowd gasped in fear. The few individuals Kieran had touched looked at each other in shock. Xavier's face went through another drastic change, not expecting Kieran to be so formidable. Kieran continued to address Xavier. Using goo to treat and make money is one thing, but planting goo poison in patients to earn a steady flow of money is unconscionable. Planting goo poison? The crowd exclaimed again. Those of you who have been cured by him have goo poison inside you. If you don't regularly consume his prescribed medicine, the Giyu will activate just like these individuals, Kieran pointed at the Lachlan family members on the ground. A collective gasp rose from the scene. You're talking nonsense, Xavier scoffed, quickly administering an antidote to the affected individuals who instantly recovered. Xavier glared at Kieran. If you don't leave now, I'm calling the police. Call the police, Kieran smirked. I'd actually like the police to shut down your herbal shop. You're asking for death. Xavier exploded in anger. Seeing his fury, Kieran knew he had pushed Xavier to his limit. He turned to several people in the crowd. You also have goo poison in you. What? The individuals were shocked. Before they could react, Kieran had already tapped them, and the Lachlan family members who had just been cured were poisoned again, lying on the ground convulsing, their faces turning ashen. Xavier was caught off guard. He had used different GU based on the illness for treatment, thus requiring different antidotes. These people were affected by a different type of goo than the one he had just treated. The Lachlan family members were, unfortunately, poisoned once again. Xavier's expression darkened, realizing he was dealing with someone highly skilled. The patients also began having doubts. Xavier's tone turned icy. Are you trying to cause trouble? Kieran shook his head. No. Then what? Xavier asked angrily. I'm going to take down the Lachlan family, Kieran declared, looking towards the grand estate of the Lachlan family with a commanding presence.